welcome to Hope Today. Man, we are thrilled to be spending this half hour yes, with you. I know that God has something in store for you today. What I want you to do is buckle your seatbelt right. because we are going to learn, we are going to grow, and we are going to push the kingdom forward today. Tom, it is so good to see Praise you. Praise God. We're going to let our light so shine yeah. that others will see the God that we worship and that we serve and, and we'll, we'll give glory to him. Praise God. Yeah, I like light. Mm, you know, light sure. dispels darkness. Light pierces through things. When, it does. When, if you're, maybe you're in a state where you're, you're foggy, you can't see clearly. Let's pray today that the light of the gospel will pierce through and you will yes. see clearly like never before, mm. which is exactly what we're going to do with our very special guest. Stephen Garofalo is here with his new book on apologetics equipped. I tell you what, this is so good. And we're going to talk about some hard questions mm. today. Tom, you know, Christians have, and, and the world has questions about our faith. And a lot of believers don't know how to respond to those hard questions. That's right. So we're going to bring some truth and some light. Well, today. Stephen will we'll be bringing out in, in, in our conversation, he'll be bringing out the ignorance Right. That, that people as a society that we have in our, in our nation, uh, uh, strikingly low numbers of people, less than one in 10, yeah. literally read their Bible every day. We pray that you're not wow. one of those uh, nine uh, out of 10 people that don't read the Bible. That's why we like to begin this time by reading the Word of God because it is the power of salvation. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read from a, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and he said, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Praise God, <laughs> praise God, a tool to equip us. It is the yeah. word of God right. that brings the power unto salvation. Well, I'm a big fan of that scripture, being a pastor well, and course. all, you know, yeah. you know, that God equips pastors, you know, God needed somebody to go and break up hard ground, mm -hmm. to go and establish some things. So he sends out the apostles and, and overseers of churches. And then he needs pastors over God's people right. to take care of them. You know, what do we do when somebody gives their life to Christ and they're a brand new babe in Christ? Well, they need a house. They need a, a church home. They need a spiritual home. And then God called pastors and overseers over those people to treat, teach them and to raise them up and evangelists that are going to go out. Here's the deal. God has called us and equipped us for his purposes. So we pray today like never before that you find and that you hear and that you see God's purpose for your life. And that our goal is, Tom, to take this gospel, mm, right? That's right? And not just keep it to ourselves, like, oh, well, we're good. We're going to heaven. But to get the gospel out into all the world. Praise God. And yeah, I'm blessed. This month, I'll be celebrating 33 years that I've had the wow. privilege, and I mean distinct privilege, of being able to go to one of our local missions, the Light of Life Rescue Mission on Pittsburgh's north side. It would have been in May of 1988 wow. that God blessed me with that opportunity, and I've been blessed ever since. Every time that I've had the opportunity to preach there, God has shown me in a vision that I'm to be one beggar telling other beggars where I found food. Wow. Never lose sight of that. And, and, and in some way, every time that I'm there, every week that I'm there, now Tuesday afternoons uh, before dinner, every time as I'm driving down to the mission, God makes that vision clear to me to never preach, never try to convince, never try to, to talk because it's the Holy Spirit that opens right. the mind and stirs the heart and moves the will of an individual. I'm merely to be one beggar telling other beggars where I found food. Tom, where would we be without the Lord? Mm. Where would we be without Don't him? Don't even want to think about it. Can't even imagine a life without him. And I hope that you know him today. 
Our next guest strongly believes that scripture should be at the forefront of apologetics. Yes. And in his new book, Equipped, Basic Training in Apologetics mm. for Evangelism, author and speaker Stephen Garofalo effectively prepares us on how to defend and advance our Christian faith. Wow, Stephen, welcome to Hope Today. Oh, thank you for having me, it's a privilege. I am excited and like I said, buckle up your seatbelts to get <laughs> into this apologetics and evangelism. Let's talk about what is apologetics and how does that relate to truth? Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. Uh, so apologetics comes from the Greek word just apologia, which is to give a defense of our faith. And I think you know, we didn't really need apologetics going back to the 50s and 40s, probably starting in the 60s, 70s we did, but more so in the 80s there forward. And you know, part of it in showing what truth is, you know, Jesus was truth. And if we don't have the truth, we don't have that is the God, the word of God is the truth. And so the uh, the need for the de to defend it is just part of it. You also, as I as you stated earlier, was really to be able to advance it. A lot of times we have to be able to defend it before we and remove obstacles to faith, even without our own faith and edification, but also just in sharing our faith with others. We have to be able to remove obstacles. And sometimes those obstacles are academic. A lot of times they're biblical or theological. And sometimes we have to realize that, hey, listen, in understanding someone's worldview and their history, we have to understand where they come, you know, where they're coming from. Yeah. We may have to understand a little bit about their past. Are they hurt? Are they in rebellion? They've been abused. That's part of the equation. A person asking the question, uh, I don't believe in God. Yeah, you have the issue of existence of God. You have to go back chapter one to worldviews. Mm -hmm. And then you have to really understand why are they asking that question? Were they abused and they just don't trust God? Or is it that they're just, it's an academic question or are they just an atheist? And we're saying, where are you gonna go when you go to heaven? And they go, why are you asking the question? I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in God. We have to, that's a little bit on the, on the lighter side, but that's kind of where apologetics becomes um, into play. And then people that are criticizing the word of God in, in uh, Christianity, we have to be able to give answers. First Peter 3.15 says, we have to be right, ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, but with right meekness and truth. So in other words, gentleness and respect. Yes. I like how you kicked off the book with, you know, what is your worldview? So can you tell me a few of the different worldviews and how our Christian faith is different than those worldviews? Yeah, yes, there's about seven worldviews, four minor, three major, and I'll just stick on the major ones uh, because that's really what's most important. You have theism. That's what we believe as Christians. Uh, but by the fact, only the Jewish people, the Jewish religion uh, uh, belief, the, uh, so you have the Jewish Israelis, you have Christianity, then you have Islam, only theistic religions in the world. And so outside of that, everything else falls under a different worldview. So we believe in a singular God. In other words, theism is there's a singular God, right? And he made all. Second uh, worldview is gonna be atheism. No God at all, God didn't create anything. Well, the problem with atheism comes down to that he didn't create anything, you know, didn't create the world is where did, where did, where did the universe come from? And then they'll say space junk and, you know, <laughs> debris, and you could say, well, who made the space junk and debris? Mm -hmm. Third uh, is pantheism. That's the basic belief of, of Hinduism coming from India. And they believe God is all. So that means God is the God of the trees. He's the God of the rocks. He really is everything. And matter of fact, we're part of, we're really part of God as, as Brahma. And once we reach enlightenment, we, and through uh, reincarnation of over billions of years, we can then come into this oneness, oneness where we have no real identity, see? there's no real Jesus. It's just that we have, we're this oneness and that's the new age movement in our modern times. And that's, that's really where we're at in today's world. So if you understand those three basic worldviews, I think you can figure out where people are coming from, where you start your conversation and sharing your faith with them and equipping your children and your Sunday school class. Well, just, and you bring up a really good point. You know, do all roads lead to Christ in these different worldviews? And that's a big question that people are asking today. Do all the roads through all religions lead to Christ? Yeah, that's the most popular, I think, chapter besides why God allows bad things to have good people, right? The, the mm -hmm. problem of pain 
and uh, that, I'm asked to speak on that. I did a whole separate book on that, and uh, I summarized it in, in Equipped. But you know, that's, it boils down to it, it's, there's a word called pluralism, which everyone, I think, understands what the word pluralism means. But religious pluralism means that basically that all religions lead to the same spiritual truth, as Barna Research asks every year. And roughly, it doesn't change much between those who somewhat believe that and who absolutely believe that it's roughly 43 percent okay um, and so uh, when you're dealing with people uh, or you're trying to understand you know this one world order we're living in this this global society and everything's global they want to make currency global they want to make right. thinking global they want to make borders global Euro. part of that as well as to have one global religion and uh, in, in part of that is that you have to understand Christianity is exclusive. And by the way, every religion is exclusive. You go to the imam in the, in the mosque and tell him, hey, do you believe that all roads lead to heaven? You know, he's not going to have a very favorable answer for you. Hinduism gives the closest in that they have over 330 million gods. And if you don't like any of them, you could just add one to it. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, it, but even then, they're just as exclusive, right? Because they're saying, no, no, hold on a second. Jesus is not the only way. It has to be all. That's just as exclusive as the one saying Jesus is the only way, Allah is the only way, and you know. And so all of them are the, the same. You know, the uh, the only way. They're, they're, it's just as exclusive as any other truth claim. Stephen, and the founder. It, and, oh, yeah. I was just going to yeah, say sorry. the the founder of Cornerstone Television, Russ Bixler. Um, was I remember having conversation and many conversations with him about he always felt that evangelism, the starting point was Genesis 1-1. You had to find that common ground with somebody to establish that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, and, and he's right. And if you go back to, I think uh, Bill Bright's Four Spiritual Laws play into that. And that's that's the starting place you need to get to. So we'll call that the existence of God. Right. But the, there's 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 a kind of an apologetic model. I break it down to four simple points because there's more than four, but I think we just need four. <laughs> and that is we can't talk about Jesus Christ today until we we show that the New Testament scriptures in particular are superior than any other ancient manuscript. OK, because if you can't figure, if you can't prove that or show that in some way, shape or form, yeah. how are you going to talk about Jesus? That's the New Testament. Right. So no Jesus until you talk about well, you can't really talk about Jesus in some cases, in many cases, unless people have a, you know, a belief in Jesus sure. and they just haven't come to a trusting faith. But so Jesus, you have New Testament scriptures, but you really can't talk about the New Testament scriptures until you talk about what you're talking about there. Does God exist? Does God but exist? not only that. Hold on a second. What is God? You know, what is he? And can we know him? That's a big sticking point for a lot of people. They'll say, well, we don't really, we know he's just pluralist. Remember, all roads lead to heaven. We, we're not sure. He's just a, a higher being. But here's the key. You can't talk about what God is or the existence of God or that we know that God exists until you establish an important question, which is what is truth? Does it exist? And can we know it? That sounds technical, but I'll challenge anybody to go out in the gym. I did this one day, went to my gym, and I was talking to a young man, and he's, he, he was a strong believer. But I said, you'll be surprised how many people don't believe that truth is absolute. And we went, there was a bunch of people lined up at the, uh, the treadmill. And I think we got two, one or two at the most out of six or seven people that were absolute. Uh, yep, truth can be known. At, most of them were, I don't know. And I think one of them was, no, absolutely not. So it's not that people are mean-hearted. It's just they no. don't have the answers. Ignorant. They just don't know. Ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why should this matter to Christians? Why should believers do their homework and study out the truth? Because Matthew 28 is very clear. We're called to go out and make disciples, by the way, disciples, right? That takes time. Uh, it's not a one-off uh, thing. It's something that takes time. And uh, in order to do that in today's global world, you have to have some level of training and apologetics. Mm. And by the way, we put Equipped into a video series. We're done with chapters one through six, and it's on the website uh, under Equipped Academy tab, and it's also at equippedacademy.com. But we did that because a lot of people 
you know, hey, I don't read books, <laughs> but they'll listen or they'll watch. But what we did is we put a book with the workbook with the video. It sounds intimidating, but it's not. Yeah. And I tell you, a, a young lady came up to me at a conference many years ago, and she said this to me. She said, Steve, can't we just get all this stuff into one book? I said, well, I don't, I'm, you know, you're not going to get all this stuff into one, but this is about as close as you're going to get, Amy. Yeah. Uh, listen, Tom, this is, this is about as, you know, as close as you're going to get to the most essential questions, I believe. I love this so much, and I know it's really, really going to help and build up our faith. We're going to be right back with more from Stephen, and we're going to talk about why do bad things happen to good people. We'll be mm. right back after this break. television our heart beats to reach just one more with the hope of Jesus Christ even when our world shakes God can never be shaken will you join us in our life-saving mission we can't do it without you our ministry is viewer supported which means you help us to spread the gospel partner with us today through easy pledge our automatic monthly giving program your contribution keeps our shows on the air it makes our prayer lines available 24 7 and it allows us to support other ministries through Cornerstone Care. Easy Pledge automatically deducts your gift every month using your credit or debit card. Sign up today by calling 888-665-4483 or by visiting our website at ctvn.org backslash donate. Thank you for helping us to be a bridge of hope to reach just one more. We are back with our very special guest, Stephen, with his new book, Equipped. Are you ready? Basics Training in Apologetics. <laughs> for evangelism. This is exciting to me because exciting. I want to be able to defend my faith. I want to be able to answer hard questions like Paul did when he was asked in the New Testament. But why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah, look at Paul, right? When he oh. when he wrote that Ephesians script, by the way, he was he was in prison in a right. barrack in a military, you know, which gives some context to the seriousness of his writing. But yeah, this is perhaps uh, the most difficult question posed to Christianity in particular, right. because Christianity is the only really religion, if you want to call it that, that is based on agape love, a God's unconditional love. Well, there's four words for, or five words for, for love. That is the word for agape that I think of. God is love. It's one of his attributes. And so people say, well, how could an all powerful and in how can an all loving and powerful God allow bad things to happen to good people? And so it, it kind of leaves you to simplify it with, well, God had a couple options, right? He could have just created us. So, you know, we were about to stab somebody and the knife stops in midair. He could have made it so we just don't sin at all. Then there would be no greater good. We call people a hero for a reason. We see greater good saving a life as a better thing. And we see sanctification is becoming better sometimes the problem of evil affecting our lives and i had this, this conversation by the way um tom and amy with my kids the other night we were doing a devotion on monday night and i said well my i lost my father when i was five and my mm -hmm. mom was stuck raising a one week old and three boys up to age 11 pretty big and she's my mom is 85 and she's a machine got cancer three years later leukemia pronounced dead at nih in uh, basically in six months in Washington, D.C. And I asked my kids, I said, now think about this. I said, why did my father, why was he taken from us at such a young age? Mm -hmm. And my one of my children said, hey, dad, but Grandma V lived. I said, yes. I said, I don't have an answer as to why my dad passed or why the Lord allowed him to be taken. By the way, he did not take my father's life. He allowed my father's life to be taken. So explaining, right. by the way, I tell you that as a teaching moment right. because you see, why did one live? I mean, I could have had no parents, and there might be people out there, by the way, who've had both parents are deceased, and you know, we need to be coming besides those people and their children. But besides the point, that is a big obstacle for Christianity, uh, not for Christianity, but for Christians to be able to answer. So a God who loves us, I mean, think about it. Jesus went to the cross freely out of his love for us. He didn't have to, but he did. He chose to freely. And we have to freely choose and accept the free gift of salvation. Yes. That's a free, that's called love. Love is not free. 
unless it's free. <laughs> it can't be compulsive. So if God just right. made us robots, then you know we would live in a world of just you know automat automata where we just where we just where God just create uh, handles every you know basically every step that we do. Having said that, I think that um, God allows things to happen because He created the best world possible to you know the best world here for the best world that's actual. In other words, this is the best world that he could create possible for the best world that is, which is going to be heaven and new heaven and new earth. Good way to put it. So good. And I, I like the idea, though, that your mom trained you. And you talk about this in your book on several occasions, that she really took the time out that you guys were prepared for life. You were prepared for your faith. You were prepared. And I just think that preparation it takes time and it takes some hard work on our part. What would you say to the Christians like, I don't know, I don't have time for this. What would you say to them? Yeah, I think that's the, uh, Amy, I think that's the, I think it's the plague of Christianity right now. Uh, I did a talk at a conference years ago called, called Reclaiming Culture for Christ Using Apologetics and Evangelism. And I thought it was the most at least academic talk at an academic conference. And I, I just about fell off my chair. You know, I was embarrassed and people loved it because uh, we tried to explain to them that, hey, discipleship is where we're missing the boat. And I went back to a guy named, did some research, a guy named Kallenberg. And he said, about 1989, we stopped discipling people. Well, what does that mean? We stopped taking the time to yes, disciple people. Right. I would encourage people, listen, this package, listen, we don't take profits at this point at all from any of the books, haven't in 10 years. We put it into developing other resources you know, the point is we wrote it so people would be equipped simply and as quickly as possible, but you have to be able to invest, you know, sometime you're not going to get equipped on a two minute YouTube. And so I would encourage them to do the book, the company workbook in their Bible study and do the video that takes the weight off you to have to learn it as I know it. Stephen, I w was an achiever uh, at, at 20 years of age. I was the youngest player on a major league roster. It was then that I received Jesus, and it took that long, even though I was a good moral young man, because I finally realized that it was a gift of God, not of works. Mm. I believe back then when I would share with others, and I was very excited to tell others about Jesus, but I'm afraid that there was a lot of pride in what I did, figuring that I could argue the point and I could talk somebody into receiving that. As these years have gone by, I know now that it's a total dependence upon the Holy Spirit, that it is in fact the Holy Spirit that opens the mind and stirs the heart and moves the will of a person into salvation. How does that play into this in trusting in the Holy Spirit to, to take that truth, to transform that person? There's two elements and that is a great question because I think that is the turning point. That's the lynch uh, key really, uh, mm. Tom, for evangelism. Nice. Um, especially in today's world. Now, first of all, when God's going to give us the words as scripture promises, we have to be studying God's word or what is he going to bring to us, right? So we have to have some, we don't have to memorize, you know, the scriptures verbatim right. uh, from cover to cover, but we have to be able to be in it and we have to be studying the word of God. He will recall, give us recall for those uh, yes. verses. But I've learned a great discipline. And that is, you know, when I worked for the police department in college many moons ago, I was assist mm -hmm. I was uh, really worked assisting the police department up did different beats and stuff. But having done that, I remember going in my sergeant, he said, listen, if there's a problem, you bring it to me. And uh, if I have an issue, I'm going to take it to the captain, he's going to take it to the president of the university, and he's going to take it to the governor if he has an issue, he takes it to the president. And then you know, he didn't say it, but I'm thinking, well, if he's got an issue, he's got to take it to God, you know. And so he said, this is called vicarious liability. <laughs> In other words, stuff flows uphill. I've learned a discipline that I am, uh, you know, is above my pay grade at times mm -hmm. as much as I may know in my mind to depend on the Holy Spirit. It, uh, there was a brief story. I was uh, out of town and meeting with uh, uh, some folks that live a very different life than we would probably love, love these guys. And um, having said that, we had great conversation and I just started praying. I said, Lord, I don't even know where to begin you know, I can, I can always start a conversation if you have figured that out. I can, you know, I love to talk. And, and, and so, you know, having said that the, the Holy Spirit really kicked in and I just watched as, mm. you know, I, we were talking about con context of the Bible, taking the Bible in and out of context. And there was pushback on that. 
And then I started praying, and then next thing you know, I had them discussing the issue that you can't take the Bible out of context. And I'm like, really? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. When he steps in, he gives you verses, and he actually steps in and really, because he's our helper. He's here with us today, the most ignored person in the Godhead. We think we pray up. The Holy Spirit is here. He's with us. He's in his heart. He's very real. And uh, if we learn to depend on him, and the first thing when we're sharing our faith is to stop or at least smile, and start praying, say, Lord, I need your help, and I need it now. Give me the words. Change and, and work within their hearts. And I think you will see, you'll be astounded, astounded by what the Holy Spirit shows up. Wow. Praise God. Thank Praise you so much, Stephen, for coming on the program today and really challenging our faith and giving us some tools and some truth that mm -hmm. we can help grow and build disciples. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you both. You know, Tom, my faith is stirred up mm. and my, um, you know, he starts off his book with a quote that I think is kind of important for now. C.S. Lewis said, if you give me 10 minutes to chop down a tree, I'll spend <laughs> the first two minutes sharpening my ax. And I think sometimes as Christians, our axes aren't sharpened. Like we, 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 we know that God is good and we can give all these cliche terms, but have we done the hard work to get into the word, to get into the scriptures, to spend time in prayer, to spend time with God and really sharpen our ax. So when we go out and we're meeting people in the world, we have something to offer them. We have something to give to them. Do you know what? I look at it this way, that it's literally falling on our knees, that we fight the battles of life on our knees. It is in prayer. It is not by our strength. It is not by our intellect. It is not by our power. It is by the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. This rock is from Elah Valley. This is the river valley where David slew Goliath. Wow. And what a story, what a story about how this shepherd boy wow. destroyed Goliath. Yes. Today, yes. God is calling you to come on your knees yeah. and to trust in Him yes. for every aspect of your life. Yeah, you know, because God loves people. God loves you so much and God loves all of these prayer requests and mm. sons and daughters that called in. Patricia called in and she re rededicated her life to Christ. Are you kidding me? This is what life is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. This is what the good news is all about. Jesus bridged the gap between God and man so that we could walk with him. We could talk with him. We could read his word. We could live out our God ordained purposes. Listen, God has an incredible plan and he has hope for you today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, stand up for your religious freedom. New York Times bestselling author Ken Starr effectively equips Christians to exercise religious liberty in a rapidly changing American culture. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.